Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the barn today for this great day in Rutgers basketball history. My name is Jason Baum, Senior Associate AD for Communications here at Rutgers. Today's speakers at the podium will be Rutgers President Dr. Robert L. Barchi, Interim Director of Athletics Carl Kirshner, and Eddie Jordan. During the question and answer portion of today's news conference with Eddie Jordan, media members please wait for the wireless microphone and state your name and media affiliation prior to asking a question. Following the news conference, there'll be brief one-on-one -on -one availability, along with photo opportunities with Coach Jordan. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, let me please introduce Rutgers President, Dr. Robert L. Barchi. Well, I have to tell you, this is the most fun I've had in front of TV cameras in the last month. I know you looked down the street and uh, in the direction of Wyandance and you saw that puff of white smoke go up. And it's my privilege to be able to announce to you what you all have known probably for longer than I have as I read the newspapers. But it is an exciting day for Rutgers, a, a new day for Rutgers, and one in which I can finally reveal what probably is the worst kept secret in town. And I don't have to tell anyone, especially anyone in this building, uh, that Mr. Eddie Jordan has a, a really a proud and deep connection and commitment to Rutgers and to the Rutgers community. He was a star on our legendary Final Four team of 1976, a magical season that was played right here on these boards and probably actually on these boards, knowing our renovation cycle. I, am, I know that we have some of his former teammates in the audience right now. And can any of those teammates who are here stand up for us? There you go, guys. The knees still work. Delighted to see that. Well, you know that Eddie has been a major part of the history of our program, and I know that uh, he's made memories in this place, and we're looking forward uh, to having him make memories for our Scarlet Knights moving forward. And in a minute, I'm going to ask uh, our athletic director, Carl Kirshner, to introduce Eddie in more detail. But let me just say a few things about him that I've noticed. We've only known each other for a period of, of hours, uh, formally. I got a chance to meet him first um, last week. But I already know that he's someone who will play a major role in moving Rutgers forward. It goes without saying that he's passionate about basketball, uh, committed to winning, and incredibly knowledgeable. But just as important, he's committed to our university's fundamentals. And what I picked up on right away is that Eddie knows what our commitment is to the atmosphere of respect and dignity here. And if I had to go back over all the positive reviews that I got when I talked about Eddie and talked uh, to folks who know him, if I had to pick out one thing, it would be the comment that I got from one of the owners of a major league uh, team that he's coached for who said, you know, here's the thing. Eddie has respect for and is respected by everyone, from the owners to the players to the coaches to the ball boy. That's what really, really impressed me. That's what I saw in this man, and that's what I know he has. Anyone in this position wants to win. Anyone in this position is passionate about basketball, but not everyone who can run a team like this can have those sorts of things said about him. I know he's the right leader at a pivotal moment for our men's basketball program, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to Carl Kirshner, and I'm personally going to say, Eddie, welcome back to Rutgers. Can't wait till you get here on the banks. Carl. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Barchi. Um, this is my second stint, I guess. I got to hire a coach. I hope I don't have a third stint as acting athletic director. So a quick story. Some of you uh, know this, some don't. I arrived to Rutgers in the fall of 1976 as a young assistant professor, about six inches taller, a lot more hair. And as a basketball fan, I went to watch the basketball team play right here. And there was this very, very good guard playing in a senior year, in a year named Eddie Jordan. So I actually watched Eddie Jordan play in his senior year, the last year that the barn was used for basketball. For those of you who do not remember or are too young, let me show you this. And we have a developing story here on Sports 
center Rutgers has had zeroed in on Lakers assistant Eddie Jordan. I'm coming home, I'm coming home. Tell the world that I'm coming home. <laughs> So in the uh, 10, 15, 20 hours that I've now known Eddie Jordan, I've come to recognize him, and it's very easy, many of you know it already, as a classy guy, open, honest, willing to listen, willing to learn, utmost integrity, just a classy guy, just a classy guy. So I think we are very, very fortunate right, to be able to have Eddie back on the banks. Rutgers University is fortunate to have not only a classy, decent man, but someone with a tremendous coaching pedigree. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Coach Edwin, Edward M. Jordan, otherwise known as Fast Eddie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Obviously, back then I was known as Fast Eddie, and as you, my, my guys know now, I'm just Hot Air Jordan. Um, I, I realized that when my teammates stood up, most of them stood up like this. Phil stood up like this. Um, again, thank you for coming. Um, I am really honored and blessed to um, be named the caretaker of our team, of our program, of our university's basketball program. And I say our because we've all come to a point that um, we have to regain our pride and our dignity and our integrity to our university. That's why I'm honored and, and proud to be part of that. Um, it is a responsibility for all of us to represent our university in the highest class and the highest, utmost respect. Today is about the future of Rutgers basketball, and we're moving forward. Um, there's some healing process that has to be done. I'm glad my, my team is here. We've got enough talent to exceed expectations. Um, we want our guys to feel good about themselves, about their future about their basketball team. And that is part of my responsibility, but it's always also a part of yours because we're all one and we all need help to regain our integrity back. <clears throat> and the program has to be built on um, two words. When I was a young coach, I talked to Casey Jones, had a conversation with him. He won 11 championships with the Boston Celtics. And I said, Casey, what's the most important part of your championship runs? And he would say, effort and harmony. Effort and harmony, meaning hard work, a great work ethic, and knowing how to get along, and knowing how to work together. So that's what the program is going to be built on, hard work and teamwork. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. I want to thank Dr. Barchi for um, his belief and trust in me. 
Um, I'd like to thank our Board of Governors and our Board of Trustees who understood the meaning of due diligence. They've, people have taken um, some criticism on the length of time, but the due diligence was very important in their minds and their actions to get this thing right. And I'm glad that they chose me. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Carl Kirshner for um, being there for me and who runs an academic support program second to none in the country. I want to thank Kate Sweeney for, for being there. She's from our era. I'm not calling out your age, Kate, but she's younger at heart. Let me just say that. Um, she was there for me. And last but not least, Brian Perkins, who acted as a surrogate brother agent um, for free. Um, and uh, he was certainly a big part of uh, motivating me, not like he had to motivate me. Um, I have one story to share with you um, because this is where I want to sort of end up going. <clears throat> there was a, there's a Jimmy Lynham who's a lifer coach, um, coached at um, St. Joe's and coached with me, is an assistant with me with the Nets, assistant with me with the 76ers. And he shared a story with me. Um, he was in a, he and St. Joe's were in a tournament and, um, and they had five or six teams in the tournament. And he had to play Temple the first, first game. As he was having breakfast, he's talking to a reporter. He's in a hotel restaurant full of people, some players from different teams, um, hotel guests. And the reporter was saying, Jimmy, you know, you can beat Temple this time. You know, John Chaney, he's, he's, way, before, he's way beyond his time. You can press him and they'll turn it over. And Jimmy says, well, you don't know, man. You don't know what I'm going against here. He says, hey, if you put up a press, they'll turn it over. Put up a zone, they'll miss shots. They're not good shooters. Jimmy says, you just don't know what I'm going against here. He says, Jimmy, you can do it. As they're talking, other coaches are coming in. How you doing, Joe? Yeah, Jimmy, you can really beat Temple this time. I'm telling you. Another coach comes in. How you doing, Bob? Jimmy, come on, you can beat. Hey, you don't know what I'm going against. And there's John Chaney. He comes to the hostess table. And as the hostess starts to seat him, he walks to the restaurant and 13 guys stood up. As he walked to his table, they stood up. When he sat down, they sat down. And the reporter turned to Jimmy, Jimmy, shucks, man, you're in a hard time tonight, man. <laughs> you got some bad luck tonight. So just that story tells you that if you can uh, mold your players and, and they have respect for you, then that's what you get. As a coach, mold them, show them what respect is, um, build a great relationship with them. And I've spent maybe three days with them, and I know we've got some talent down there um, to exceed people's expectations. And winning is always in the equation, not just healing, not just relationships, not just getting the program back, but winning is always in the equation. And that's what I want our guys to understand. We're going to play, build up relationship, trust, belief, and there's always a phrase I like to say, faith before duty. Believe in each other, believe in the program, believe in what we're doing, and go out and do it right. Okay? Again, thanks for coming, and I'm glad to be here. And uh, media members, just raise your hand, wait for the wireless microphone, and we'll take questions right here. Thank you. Yes. Coach, welcome back to New Jersey. David Cruz, NJTV. Can you elaborate a little bit on what stylistic differences Rutgers fans can expect between you and your predecessor? I really don't know what my predecessor did as far as X's and O's. Um, I know we want to be up-tempo. We want to um, play just like we played in the, in the year I played. Force turnovers. Uh, your defense will create the offense. 
um, open the floor up. I think you always play to your best player. And I know a couple of guys already who are our best players. And that's what we'll do. We'll, your team shows you how to play. And um, I just know it's going to be exciting. They're going to work hard, and they'll share the basketball. Just a quick follow-up, if I can. Are you concerned about the five players who have said that they don't want to come back next year? No, I'm not concerned. Um, the most important thing for me was to recruit our players. And every day I've got at least one or two in my office, on the floor, talking to them, texting them, calling them. And um, again, it's about building relationships. It's not going to happen overnight. I've talked to a lot of parents, and even they're as hurt as the players. Um, and maybe out of the 10 parents that I call, eight, players, eight parents that I talked to, two were really, really enthusiastic about their child coming back, this young man coming back, and the other were hurt. And it's a process. And um, it's hard to just gain trust in one phone call. But it's a due diligence for me to do it every day. And I'm not giving up until that player is out of the door and into another school. Thank you. Eddie, welcome back. Uh, Thank George you. Falkowski from News 12 New Jersey. Knew you with the Nets. And, uh, I guess probably something you heard in your interview, but the one question I'd want to ask above all is, given everything that you've seen transpire here over the past month or so, what makes you the right guy at the right place at the right time? Uh, coaching style. Um, I like to build relationships. I like to put my arm around the players and ask them, what do you see on the basketball floor? Um, you, I always was taught, even by the great Pete Carrill, that the lower you talk and you talk to the team, they'll come in closer. And uh, maybe he just couldn't yell, but the, the lower you talk, the closer they come and they, they understand. And the learning process, I've always thought was you pay attention, you listen, you pay attention. You understand. Number two, you comprehend. And number three, you remember it. Four, you apply. And five, you repeat it. And that's the learning curve for, for the way I teach. John Rothstein, CBS Sports Network. Right here. OK. <laughs> Rutgers has always been perceived as a sleeping giant because of its geographic location, because of recruiting. Just for you personally, this is your alma mater, what's changed in your eyes considering the fact that this program will be in the Big Ten in a year? Does that change anything in terms of your approach with regards to your staff recruiting? What elements change now that you'll be competing in the Big Ten versus the Big East? I, I think, you know, recruiting, and I've done recruiting for eight years when I was in college, seven of my eight years. And recruiting is pretty much the same every school you go to. You have rules you have to abide by. You find the top talent in the country, you do your work, and you make your contacts, and you keep plugging and plugging. And that's what recruiting is, whether you're at UCLA or you're at Rutgers. Um, Tom Young and Joe Borland, Borland came and said we were a sleeping giant, and what, look what happened in three years. So um, it's a, not a sleeping giant anymore because of what happened, but we're moving forward. And again, it's about finding, identifying the top talent, which is not hard to do nowadays, um, and finding the people that fit what you want, and character is in there. When you look at how you build a good team, talent is always number one. Toughness is two. Three is um, character. And four is experience. Young talent doesn't win much. All right? uh, talent that's not tough doesn't win much. That's why we won with Phil Sellers. Um, and you have to have great character. So all those four ingredients make up a good player that makes a good team. Yes. Eddie, whoops. Paul Franklin, uh, Middlesex County, old folks home. I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you might. I'm not going to share any stories, so don't worry. Uh, looking at your teammates being in this place, what, what memories come to mind? Uh, well, jeez, uh, that we were a determined to be good. And um, we had a great player in Phil. And all of us, the rest of us, were good players. We were good. And we were talented. And we used what was good for us. We used our speed. We used our quickness. Um, we used our harmony that we knew who the best shooter was. 
we knew how to get the ball up the floor. Um, we knew how to press and, and play off each other. Um, and those are the qualities of a good team. And again, if the Boston Celtics can win with harmony and effort as their, their mantra, then that's where we're going to start. Bruce Speck, WNBC TV. Hey, Bruce. Welcome, Eddie. Thank you. Forty years ago, a young kid from the Washington area came to Rutgers, and the rest, as they say, is history. So what do you say to an 18-year-old kid today? Why should he come to Rutgers? Why should he play for you? Why should a parent entrust their young man in your hands? Number one, uh, you enjoy the Rutgers experience. It's a great place to be. It's a great degree. Okay, that's number one. Unfortunately, there are a lot of kids, student athletes, who think that playing in college for two years or one will get them to the NBA. And if that's the case, then there's some, um, some qualities that I possess that I understand what the NBA is about. Um, but certainly, the Rutgers experience is a great experience. Going to the Big Ten is um, great expectations. The Big Ten who has the best network in the country that even though we'll be in Minnesota, we'll be on every TV screen in the country. And um, that's a heck of a recruiting pitch, that it is the best academic, athletic, and uh, exposure network in the country. Um, Zach Braziller, New York Post. Eddie, what made you want to come here, watching what has transpired over the last month? It was, that's a no-brainer. I wanted to come here 10 years ago. I wanted to come here three years ago. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't because of what happened. I've always wanted to coach Rutgers. And I'm glad that I've gotten all the experiences that any possible coach can have. Heck, I even coached ninth graders last summer. Uh, I coached my son's eighth grade team. I coached uh, one of the elite AAU teams, 17 and unders, last summer and won a national championship with an AAU team. So I've run the gamut of coaching. I've been an assistant, I've been a head coach, I've been a player on a championship team, I've been part of a team that went to the finals in the New Jersey Nets. Uh, heck, I even said a few things to Kobe Bryant without him snapping my head off. So uh, I've run the gamut. It's, it's my experiences that should help these young men right here succeed. Hey, Tom Canavan with the AP. How you been? Good. Uh, you've been around Tom Young long enough to know that he had a guy who did his recruiting for him. I mean, a coach can only do so much. Who are you going to get to be your recruiter? Well, right now we have two capable recruiters, recruiters that I thought was necessary to retain and evaluate, um, David Cox and, and Van are very capable recruiters in very crucial areas, New York and Washington and Philly and Baltimore. Um, and you, I still believe you can win with the talent in your area. Um, I think that uh, there will be other positions that may become available for us. And I have, uh, and it's funny that I wanted to mention this, I've had uh, ex a former NBA All-Stars call to be part of my staff. I've had uh, ex-NBA coaches to be part of my staff. I've had um, ex-players, NBA players, great college coaches be part of my staff. So how attractive is Rutgers? That attractive, okay? That attractive. So... There won't be a problem finding other people, and I will bring other people in to interview. Is David staying then? Pardon me? Is David staying? For the time being, we're staying together. Is there, there's a comfort level with our players, with David Cox and with Van, and uh, that's important to me. There's continuity, and if there's trust with them, that's important to me, okay? And that's important to them. Over here, Eddie. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Tara Sullivan from the Bergen Record. Hi. hi. Um, the whole world saw the video 
that was out there about Rutgers basketball. I'm curious if you could share, as a Rutgers person, how you felt when you saw what happened to the Rutgers name through that, and sort of if you could describe for us, in contrast to that, what your coaching style is. I mean, if you're a tough coach but not crossing lines, just kind of give us a sense of who you are in dealing with your players. Um, you know, I, every individual in this room had feelings. I had the same feelings as everyone here, and I don't want to rehash those. Um, moving forward, I've coached probably difficult players, um, and they were great as far as competitiveness, um, trusting what I teach, and um, you know, Kenya Martin, Gilbert Arenas, especially. Um, those guys <laughs> were Gilbert Arenas prior to what he did. Uh, and I understand different personalities. But again, it's about coaching and teaching. Um, it's about, um, there's I always said there's a road we want to go down. Everyone has their personalities within those boundaries of that road. No one, not no one, hard, hardly everybody walks the straight and narrow, right? We we'll always see there's a line in the middle of the road. Hardly anybody walks that straight line. And I'd like to say, all, some of us have personalities that walk like this. Some have personalities that walk down the road like this, right? But you can't break the boundaries. And I allow you to have your personalities. And, but there are all rules, right? Already we instituted a rule. What's the rule? What was the first rule I gave you guys? No hats in the building. That's right. OK. That's a small step. <laughs> so, uh, so there are personalities that you coach. And my style is hands-on. Um, uh, I always like to say, I'll say to Miles, Miles, what do you see out there? Do you see a driving lane? Do you see um, Kadeem open? Is Kadeem open in the post? Can you go back door? Do you need a dribble handoff? Do you need a pick and roll? What do you see? Tell me. And good players make good coaches. Bad players get you fired. Eddie, hi, Steve Politi from the Star Ledger. Have you received any assurances at all about the renovations of the rack and how important is that to, to build this program? I understand the scoreboard will be in for sure in August, okay? Um, we want the product on the floor to fill up this, whatever seats we have. That's what I'm concerned about. And I've seen um, drawings, I've seen uh, um, s scales, models, but my job right now is to save my players and to get them to understand and, and to trust me. Um, I'm low maintenance, all right? Sometimes my qualities, I guess, call them qualities, are my, are my um, weaknesses. I'm open-minded, I'm patient, and I'm low maintenance. But um, I think what's important to me, my mindset on a daily basis, is to save my players. Eddie, right here in the middle in the front. Uh, Sam Hellman from uh, Fox Sports. Being in the NBA for so long, what kind of adjustment do you expect it to be to come back to the college game? Heck, I had to make adjustments going to the NBA because when I watch NBA games, there's, a whole lot of, there's not a whole lot of contact nowadays. I watch a college game and there's contact everywhere. I mean, hands and bodies flying and hands all on your right mouths. There's no calls out there when people are guarding you with their hands. Um, in the NBA, you put your hands out there, it's a foul. I mean, I love the college game. And you know, something's interesting. When I was in college for eight years, I never watched the NBA game. I never wanted to go to the NBA. My nose was to the grindstone worrying about my college experience. When I was in the NBA, I didn't watch much college, but um, because I have to do NBA stuff. I think it's not going to be a whole lot of adjustments. I mean, a chess pass is a chess pass, ninth grade, or NBA All-Star. I mean, if you fill this entire gym, gym up with pictures of NBA plays, 90% of them you'll see fundamentals, okay? And fundamentals will never fail you on any level. You play hard, you play together. Harmony and effort. Coach, Wally, back here Wally's getting the... itchy down there. Coach, all the way back here in the stage, Cameron Bowman with Rutgers today. Can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, why you wanted to get back to Rutgers so badly 
and um, where this ranks in your coaching career. Where this ranks? Where well, I'm zero zero, so it's okay right now. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's all from the heart, man. I mean, it's, it's from the heart. Um, I know I have a lot of support, and again, this is our school. This is the Rutgers community uh, has to help all of us to bring our university back to um, to some respect and some integrity. And unfortunately, this not unfortunately, this is the centerpiece of what happened. This is the centerpiece that's going to bring it forth. Can you hear me, Tom Lewis yes, from the Star Tom Ledger? Um, what, what's your, I know you want to hit the ground running. What's your immediate schedule going to be like uh, next couple of weeks? What are you looking well, forward to accomplishing? Obviously, the NCAAs have periods where you can evaluate, where you can bring people in, where you can't do something. Um, I'm visiting a recruit tonight in New York. Um, I'm taking Phil with me because it might be a tough neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, evaluate. Um, two major AAU tournaments this weekend in Philadelphia and in Hampton, Virginia. Um, so those are the immediate, uh, and I'm still talking to players who are on the fence of leaving and coming back, and I have to be available for them. And next week, we're not to, after this weekend, there's no evaluation period for a while. So we'll be uh, doing what most schools will be doing, bringing kids on campus. Um, some of our immediate attention will go to um, junior college transfers who can play right away, um, fifth year seniors who could, who has a year of eligibility, um, uh, seniors who are, haven't committed, who I'm going to see tonight. Um, so we want to re replenish our roster if in fact more, uh, more kids leave than I expect, okay? I'm hoping that uh, our relationship, and we're all in this, I'm going to bring a couple of guys keep a couple of guys in here. All right, and I, I've always said that we can have one of the most dynamic backcourts in the country if we can retain a couple of guys and with Miles. One more. That's it. Thank you very much. See you. Um, if I could just ask Eddie's former teammates if they could come to the stage, we uh, just want to have you guys pose for a photograph. Uh, Eddie's former teammates to the stage, please. Thank you. You want me to stay here? Yes. Oh. Yeah, we'll have them come. Yeah. Just did. 